In this series, I'm building a ZX Spectrum using an EEPROM to generate the raster sequence instead of the famous, or sometimes infamous, uncommitted logic array. In this video, I'm going to get the keyboard interface and the VGA system working. In the beginning, in the ZX80, the Z80 CPU was basically completely occupied with generating the video signal. If we wanted to do any actual computation, we lost the video. Even processing a key press caused us to temporarily lose sync. The ZX81 managed to cover out some time during the vertical blanking period to do some computation while maintaining sync. If you're interested, I have a complete video series available on how the ZX80 and ZX81 work. The ZX Spectrum was upgraded to use dynamic RAM. Some very clever timing was used to allow this memory to be shared between the CPU and the video system without penalizing the CPU too much. I have a couple of videos which go over this in much more detail. The passage of time. I now have the luxury of using static RAM chips which are much faster than the CPU. For a Z80 CPU running at 3.5 MHz, the clock signal will be low for 140 nanoseconds and high for 140 nanoseconds. The 628, 128, 128 kilobyte static RAM has an access time of between 50 and 80 nanoseconds, which means I can easily perform two memory accesses per CPU clock cycle. In theory, this should be simpler to use than the complex timing of the original ZX Spectrum. What I can do is allow video access to the memory while CPU clock's low, and then give the CPU access to the memory while clock's high. That means we can use a common address bus for the CPU and video, we just need to add in some tri-state buffers. Unfortunately, the Z80 wants the data from the memory to be stable for more than half a clock, but we can trick the Z80 into seeing this data longer by including this octal D-type flip-flop. This is one of the main innovations of this series, and we saw in the last video that it actually works. So far, I've programmed the EEPROM to output a video signal with PAL timing, and the CPU is clocked at half the desired rate. But this idea of using the Octal D-Type flip-flop to keep the Z80 happy during video access seems to work. Now I want to add in the keyboard interface to the machine. Ultimately, I'm going to use the rubber keys with the pressure membrane for the keyboard in this clear case, but it's really hard to debug the circuit with this keyboard attached. The CPU interface to the keyboard in the Spectrum is almost exactly the same as the one used by the ZX80 and ZX81. Although the I.O. space for the Z80 is touted as being 8 bits, in the Z80, the in A, C actually outputs a 16-bit on the address bus during the port access, with the lower 8 bits coming from the C register and the upper 8 bits coming from the B register. Many have argued that this instruction should actually be called in A, B, C. This is the schematic diagram for the ZX80, and this is a little more understandable. The CPU performs an in instruction. The B registers present on address lines A8 through A15, which selects half a row of keys. When a key is pressed, this signal goes back into a buffer, which is read by the CPU. Now, you'll notice that there's a bunch of diodes here, and these aren't actually required if only one key is pressed at a time. But if there are no diodes, we were shooting to get the two or more address lines when two or more keys are pressed. The ZX Spectrum is almost the same, except the arrangement of the keys is a little different, and I'm not really sure why this is the case. I've added in this circuitry using the diodes connected to the address lines and a 74HC245 to receive the signals. Unfortunately, I didn't film this part of the build. Ultimately, I am going to use the rubber keys and membranes the ZX Spectrum uses, so I have these connectors installed to interface with the membrane ribbon cable but this is a pretty delicate system, and it's going to be hard to debug the machine with the membrane keyboard attached. What I want is a more robust keyboard that I can use temporarily during debug. In the ZX81 series, I built this keyboard, which was designed by iNimble Sloth, which uses MX Cherry keys, and it's really great, but I do struggle with the space key. I did have a ZX81 back in the day, but my muscle memory for using the ZX series space keys is completely lost. I'm constantly instinctively reaching for the space bar. But I was really happy when I saw this project from David Collins, where he built a ZX81 keyboard with an actual space bar. David graciously made his printed circuit board available through PCBWay, 
so I had some made and built a replica. To interface to this machine, I put in a row of strip header behind the membrane connectors, which are wired in parallel. The only main difference between the ZX81 and ZX Spectrum is that we have to twist the short cable by 180 degrees and swap the positions of pins 3 and 4 on the long connector by flipping these wires. Aside from that, it works well. So now I have a working keyboard interface. Excellent. For those aspiring to build your own machine at home, whether they be a ZX Spectrum or otherwise, I'm hoping you can see that the machine should take different forms during debug. Getting a little creative during debug is often the key to getting these machines to work. I found that to be true whether building a simple Z80 circuit or a massive GPU. High resolution graphics. Up to a massive 48K of RAM. Sound and full 8 color capability. All available from £125. I give you the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Now, the ZX Spectrum is called a Spectrum for a reason, and that's because it has color. Now, one option is to add a color subcarrier to the PAL signal, and the process is somewhat similar to generating NTSC, which I've outlined in this video here. But for this build, I'm going to try and implement a VGA interface. In the last video, I arranged the video EEPROM to be a finite state machine, and each state was one pixel. All pixels were included from the active, inactive, and sync areas. In fact, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between screen pixels and the EEPROM addresses. The data stored at each pixel address is actually the address of the next pixel. It kind of ends up looking like a circular linked list. The spectrum display itself has 256 active pixels across, so we can just have a one-to-one -one mapping horizontally. Next, I arranged it so that our CPU clock is a quarter of the dot clock, and this is just baked into the architecture. Increasing the dot clock to 14.318 MHz will increase our CPU clock to 3.58 MHz, which is slightly fast. I may go back to 14 MHz later. VGA operates at 60 frames per second, so with the 31.5 kHz horizontal sync, we get 525 scan lines. We only need 192 scan lines for the display, but this will look pretty awful squished up the top. So I'm going to do a 2 to 1 stretch vertically. But 292 scan lines becomes 384 scan lines in VGA. This means I'm going to need to go over each scan line twice. Here's how I'm planning to program the finite state machine for VGA. I'll map all of the even scan lines to a chunk located at 0 hex in the EEPROM, and I'll map all the odd scan lines to 2000 hex in the EEPROM. What this means is that video address 13 of the finite state machine is actually the least significant bit of the line count. But the memory storing the image never sees this bit because of this circuit. So, from the memory's perspective, we just run over each scan line twice. Next, we have to worry about color. These registers store the pixel data and attribute value for the next 8 pixels to be displayed. The way these registers are configured, the attribute buffer is clocked at exactly the same time that the shift register is loaded. This occurs on the positive edge of clock bar. The attribute register outputs a color for the background of the active area called the paper color, and it has three bits, red, green, and blue. It also outputs a foreground color for the active area, which is called the ink color, and it's also in the form of three bits, one each for red, green, and blue. For example, ink is the colour of the text, and paper is the colour for the background of the text. There's also a brightness bit and a flash bit which we'll look at in a minute. We have a 74HC166 shift register, which serialises the pixel byte into a stream of pixels. To manage the region outside the active area, we have another register which is clocked by the out instruction from the CPU. To combine all these together to create a video signal, we need some 4 to 1 multiplexes which can switch between the paper colour, the ink colour, and the border colour. I can do this with a pair of 74HC253s, which are 4 to 1 multiplexes. The trick here is with the brightness signal. Note that the brightness bit is the same for both the ink and paper, and this brightness signal can only be used in the active area. 
Now we have an RGB signal with brightness coming out of the multiplexers, which is 4 bits, but I can't feed this directly into a VGA monitor. What I'm going to do is expand this 4 bits into 6 bits using some AND gates. This will give us 2 bits for each of red, green and blue. If red's off, both red bits will be off, even if brightness is on. But if red's on and brightness off, then only one red output will be on. But if red's on and brightness is on, then both red bits will be on. This gives us three levels per colour, but the brightness is the same for all three colours. I'll feed these signals through another Octal D-type flip-flop to align them, although this probably isn't necessary. Then, I'll add in some simple voltage divider resistor networks to generate the analogue signals and feed them directly to the VGA connector. Here's the build for that circuit. I'm still using the point-to-point -point wire scheme I used previously. For a moderate sized build, going directly to a printed circuit board is actually quite tricky. You really only have a couple of small bugs in the PCB before you have to trash the whole thing. I much prefer to at least prototype with point to point wiring, and once I'm relatively confident with the design, then we can go to printed circuit boards. Admittedly, printed circuit boards are much cheaper and easier to design than when I learned to do things this way, and point to point wiring does require a reasonable level of confidence with the soldering iron. The nice thing is, this strategy lets you design, build and debug in stages. You just need a general idea of how big the overall project's going to be. To be honest though, I thought I'd have a lot more space left over than I do, but I think it will all fit on this single board. Now to test it. I don't have the infrastructure in place to load or store programs at the moment, so what I've done is run Jet Set Will in an emulator, Halt it at an appropriate point and dump the image into an EEPROM. Exactly, I mean, the games market alone is. Games, games, everywhere I go, games. This is what my lifetime of achievement has been reduced to. Clive Sinclair, the man who brought you Jet Set F***ing Willy! This machine isn't running Jet Set Willy, but I've swapped out the static RAM and put in place an EEPROM with a Jet Set Willy screenshot in the frame buffer and attribute buffer. From the video circuit's perspective, there's no difference whether the Z80 created this image or whether it's just stored in EEPROM. The upside is it lets me test with a static image. This looks pretty good. This is Jet Set Willy on a VGA display. Excellent! I still have a few minor issues to deal with, but in the next video, I'll do the system level bring up, make an interface for uploading software, then try out a couple of games.